Good afternoon and welcome to our PTV talk session today. Today we have PTV experts Levi Button and Sean Fitzgerald will present a PUDO integration and theme park ride simulation with PTV VSIM. Just a couple of items before we get started. This is our last PTV Talks of 2023. In early 2024, we will release our next PTV Talk schedule with a sign-up sheet for automatic registration for all sessions. Please be on the lookout for this email. If you're interested, we have one last web-based training course, PTV VSIM, Introduction to Microscopic Traffic Flow Simulation on December 6th. Our 2024 training course schedule is available and you can find this information out at training.ptvgroup.com. At the end of the session, we will have a Q&A, but you are welcome to enter your questions in the question box at any time throughout the presentation. And we also have a few poll questions today that will be asked throughout the webinar. They only take a moment of your time and we appreciate your participation. And now I'll pass the mic to Levi to begin our presentation. Welcome in everybody. Um, I hope you all can hear me okay. I'm going to kick us off with our first poll question just to kind of wake everyone up and, and get everyone going. So if you don't mind taking a moment or two to, to answer those questions or the, the quick poll question and then uh, we'll get into some of the uh, other topics. So real quick, just how familiar are you with uh, the integration of pickup drop off or crowd management within PTV vSIM or, you know, this walk, whichever one you want to call it. Okay. Give everyone a couple moments to, to get their, get their responses in. Okay. All right. So, um, Tiffany, are the, is this something that you want? Do we want to share share the results? I guess, no. or do I just go no. on to the next one? No, we'll just go on to the next one. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, I mean, every we we had people answer, um, and it sounds like some of you are, or most of you are, somewhat familiar. Um, so that that gives us a good kind of kicking off point to know where everyone's at. Uh, going through the webinar so I know kind of which side to focus on. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to eventually build up to how to to do more some, some more complex crowd management through uh, a complex queuing system at something like a theme park ride. Um, but we got to kind of start with the basics and build it up. And the first thing I want to talk about is the difference in vSIM um, between formal versus informal queuing, um, at least my definition of formal versus informal uh, queuing as it pertains to our, our software. So to start off, I'm gonna talk about some formal queuing, um, at least uh, the definition that I've made up again. So it's, it's more single file, uh, very orderly, and pedestrians are processed one at a time. Uh, so these might be situations like you might think of like TSA, you know, or, or airport security, or maybe like a grocery store with multiple checkout lines or a bank teller or something like that, where you might have um, one or several queue locations, um, but everyone's more or less being processed single file, one at a time kind of, kind of situation. Um, and how you set up these more formalized queues. Um, okay, so sorry, again, some examples would be similar to vehicular queuing, um, something that you might do in a car, uh, ticketing plazas, restroom lines, uh, concession stands, things like that um, at these at these larger events that you might be simulating in, in VizWalk. Um, whereas an informal queue is, is something that's a little bit more group, people are more grouped up, uh, there, it's a little more disorderly, kind of spaced out. Uh, people are processed in mass, um, and, and or uh, something like a theme park ride that you might be familiar with, right? Where you're standing with your family, and it's not really single file. There's just kind of, you know, kind of a corralled area where people, where the, where the the group of 
individuals are kind of flowing in a specific direction, right? And so some examples of these might be staging areas, uh, early arrivals before the events, like if you think of like a concert or uh, a sporting event or at a theme park, you know, before the gates open or something like that, everyone's just kind of standing in a lobby area or a parking lot or, or some sort of staging area waiting for the gates to open. So they're not technically queued up, but they're all waiting for something. Um, boarding gates at an air at an airport uh, gate is is very uh, similar, right? So there there would be a formal queue while everyone's checking into the flight um, to go down the jet bridge, but before that, there's kind of an informal queue of people just waiting in the in the gating area, right? And then curb sides, um, there's not necessarily a a formal queue, maybe there is at a taxi stand, but if you're thinking of like rideshare pickup or the arrivals curbside at an airport, um, people are are waiting um, in and they're waiting for specific triggers to kind of to kind of come up. So we're going to start with how to set up the two different types of queues at kind of a basic level, and I'm going to kind of walk through that. Um, so uh, if we're talking about a formal queue setup, we have a, a very specific specific queuing system that you can do within VISM. And so you're going to start with the areas that represent the space that the first person in the queue is going to be standing on. And so you're going to create those areas. And in this image, you know, you see those little blue squares. Um, and those are going to be the heads of the queues. You imagine these as like the space just in front of the ticketing counter or in front of the bank teller or, or, or the checkout stand or something like that. In those areas, there's going to be an option when you create the area to flag it as a queue. Um, and so if you flag this as a queue, when a person steps onto it, they will stand on a specific edge of it. And then everyone else that joins will join in a nice orderly single file line. Um, you'll then set a dwell time on the area. There'll be a space on the area uh, creation screen to set a dwell time distribution. And this will just be set to whatever your processing time is. So you might, you know, if you're talking about, you know, the the, the ticketing um, booth or, or, you know, at an airline, right? There's the check-in counters. Uh, basically what you're going to do is you're gonna measure how long a, a transactions take and you'll create a distribution of, of those transactions. And then you'll assign it to the queuing area. Um, and in a formal queue, these will be processed one at a time. So the first person in the queue will deal with this dwell time distribution and then step away. And then the second person in the queue will step forward and then their timer will start when they reach the front of the line and so on and so forth. Um, finally, you'll need, if you have several queues, you'll need a uh, an advanced area upstream somewhere where people are going to look ahead and they're going to say, okay, I have three counters to choose from, which one am I going to? Um, so you'll need a, a, a queue selection area upstream and a route that navigates them to that queue selection area. Once they touch that queue selection area, there will be a partial route that will then distribute them to the counters. And we have several different ways to distribute people to the various counters. Um, the common ones are gonna be either based on the queue length, or you can do a formula-based uh, route that will distribute people based on certain attributes, right? So if you're thinking of, okay, I'm arriving at some theme park or something like that, and you need to, you need to have your ticket scanned, you're gonna look for the line that it has the shortest queue, right? And so you're going to use queue length as your determining factor. Um, if you're at uh, an airline, there will probably be something like, you know, the the general passengers, and then there will usually be some sort of like membership line or, or uh, elite line or, or something like that, where it's like, you know, first class passengers get to skip and go to this other specialty uh, a line. And so that would be something like a formula-based route. We also have partial routes that can be based on travel time and number of people and things like that, the volume. So you can have them look ahead and say, okay, even though one of the, you know, we've all done this in a grocery store when there's several checkout lines, right? 
you kind of look ahead and you say, okay, that line is the shortest, but it also is moving very slowly, right? Or this line is longer, but it's moving quickly, right? And so you might choose lines based on which one has the shortest travel time, not necessarily the longest queue. So we'll set up those various partial routes and, and things like that to have the people select between the queues. Moving on to an informal queue setup, and I'm going to jump into an example after this and, and set up both of them in one VSIM example, so you will be able to see that. The difference between a formal queue and an informal queue setup is an informal queue setup, you're going to set up some sort of bounding area. So instead of having these, these three squares at the, at the front of the queues, right, we're going to just have a general space where people are going to just stand around and kind of wait for their turn to be serviced. Um, you'll set up a dwell time on this area, and this dwell time will be relative to when the, the pedestrians arrive by default. So if one pedestrian arrives first, they'll be just randomly standing on this area, they'll get a random dwell time, and then a second person will arrive and they'll get a random dwell time. And generally, they'll kind of go in order of arrival, but they won't necessarily be in a single file line. Now, if you have a really wide distribution, uh, like a distribution between one and 10 minutes, then just randomly, some people might arrive later, but be served first because their random dwell time was uh, shorter, right? So um, you can have a little bit more disparity there if you have very broad distributions on your, on your dwell times. Um, and then as far as like routing the pedestrians through these spaces, um, it's pretty straightforward. You just need to have an intermediate point on the route that says, hey, check in on this area. Uh, people can walk across this area without picking up the dwell time. So if you have people routed from, for example, this green space to the red space, but there's no intermediate point, they'll just walk over the area without stopping. They, in order for them to stop, they'll need to have a, a route designating them to stop there on their on their way, right? So this might be something like, you know, if you think in an airport, some people, um, you know, when they arrive, they'll go directly to security. Other people will detour off to the check-in counters to check in bags and things like that, right? So only the people that would need to to stop would would stop and other people can pass through the space without having to stop. So this is going to be the first opportunity for us to jump into or for me to jump into an example file and kind of show you how to set up these these two uh, queuing spaces. So I'm going to open up VSIM 2024. And um, here we have the same spaces with two different queue uh, or two different volume setups. We have routes going from one end to the other um, and the same volumes of pedestrians. I'm just going to up these volumes a little bit from 50. I'm going to do it to like uh, 200 or something like that, 200 pedestrians per hour. So if I just run the simulation, we should see pedestrians crossing these, these two areas. Now what we want to do is we want to add in some queuing areas. And so if we're doing a formalized queue, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add in an area that is that queue decision area. So uh, I like to just give it a, a different color. This, this pad is just going to be a place for those pedestrians to navigate to where they're going to um, step onto this area and then look ahead and see, okay, which which queues are available to me. So again, we'll have our static route that, that their destination is over here, but they have this intermediate activity that they have to do in between. We can then create some areas that represent the starts of those queues. So this might be counter one or something like that. The big difference here is after I change the color of it, um, you'll need to first add in a dwell time distribution. That time distribution will be uh, whatever the transaction time is, the processing rate of that, of that specific counter will be. Then we'll flag this as a queue. So by checking this as a queue, this makes it a formalized queue where the pedestrians won't just walk and randomly stand on this area. They'll stand in a single file line as they, as they queue up. 
Now, if you flag an area as a queuing area, what you'll want to do is turn it into the wireframe mode because each area is going to have a leading edge. And it's kind of based on how you drew it. And it's always going to be the second edge, but that's that's kind of hard to remember all the time. So if you just toggle into wireframe mode, you'll see a little yellow arrow pointing in the direction of the front of the queue. So what this is saying is if somebody queues up here, they'll be facing to the right. And I want them facing up. So I'm just going to rotate that area using the Alt key so that the queue is facing kind of northward. So now when somebody queues up on this area, they'll stand on at the front of this area, this arrow, and everybody else will queue up in the opposite direction. So now what I can do is if I have several um, counters, we're just going to copy this counter over uh, like so. So now I have three counters that people might, might approach. And so far, what we have is we have the static route that is navigating this queue selection area. So now we just need to put in a partial route. Make sure you select pedestrian routes, partial route. And on this queue selection area, I'm going to add in a partial route. Now, when you add in a partial route in VizWalk, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to tell, ask you what type of routing decision method do we want to use? And we have several route choice methods. We have static, which is based on relative flows. So you can type in counts of people that go to each counter. We have route decisions where they'll choose based on which one has the best travel time, which one has the most people at it, which one has the highest density, uh, and a formula-based route, which you can, you can kind of create your own logic. The one we're going to use is this one called service point selection. The way I think about this is this is just the queue length. It's going to look at which one has the longest queue, and they're going to join whichever counter has the longest queue. When you select the service point option, it's going to have this extra question down below that says, OK, how many people are allowed to queue up at each counter? If we're talking about something like a bank, there's going to be a single line, and then you're going to wait for an available uh, bank teller. And you're not going to queue up directly behind somebody because then that gets too close to them for their personal information and stuff like that, right? So you're going to stay back at the main queue. So in that case, you're going to say zero people queuing there, meaning that you will only approach a counter if there's no queue at all. If we're at something like a grocery store, you might type in, you know, a bunch of nines because what you're going to do is you're just going to join any queue. Um, uh, regardless of how long that queue is, but you'll kind of try to choose the one that that's the shortest, but you, there won't be a limit to the number of people. So for example, if I put a two down, that means that we can have a maximum of two or three people at a, uh, uh, I think it's three because it technically adds one. So there'll be the main person and then two people queued up behind them. So if we click two people, then we'll need one route for each counter and we'll put it on the same destination as our as our static route. And then we'll just put an intermediate point through each one of these counters. So now we have a 30 second dwell time on each one of these counters. We'll hit play, save changes. And then as people join, they're going to walk up, determine which queue they want to go to. I'll up this volume a little bit more just so we can see more people coming through. You'll see people come to this 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 area here and then pick which which counter they want to join. Now over here we have an informal queue. So how you'll set up an informal queue is pretty straightforward. You'll just define some queuing space. Blue. And you'll select a dwell time. And then finally, you'll just take this route and you'll just put an intermediate point on that that blue that blue area or, or whatever space you want it to be. I could have made this whole space a queuing area. Um, and then what will happen is as pedestrians arrive, they'll just randomly stand on different areas within this, this queuing area. And then after they'll get a dwell time, and then after that dwell timer checks down, 
they will walk away. So as they arrive, their dwell timer starts and then and then they can move on from there. So again, if I up this volume to say like 500 pedestrians per hour, you'll see pedestrians come in, they'll just stand randomly. They might walk around a little bit, but they'll still stay within this blue area and then they'll eventually they'll eventually leave. So that's an, that's the difference between a formalized queue and an informalized queue where we have people making single file lines versus people kind of not making single file lines. Okay. So now that we have this idea between a formal queue and an informal queue, the next thing we, we want to do is we want to go into that informal queuing and start looking at staging areas. Now, staging areas by by the definition for this webinar are just areas where you want people to wait for some activity to start right so this could be you know a staging area could be a airline gate it could be the lobby of some event um it could be uh you know a parking lot where you're waiting for the doors to open or curbside or something like that so some area where a mass of people are going to go and they're going to wait for some triggers to, to tell them to do their next activity. Now, traditionally we have um, used staging areas and then you might model the, the uh, exit to that staging area using something like a signal. Um, and what we're gonna walk through today is more using the dwell times option. This is the preferred option, um, but I'm gonna show you both just so you can kind of see both. And I'm going to start with this signals option. This isn't necessarily preferred, but there are certain scenarios in which you might use a signal as opposed to using the dwell times like we just saw. Um, so if we set up a signal, I'm not going to set this one up like I did the other example files. I'm just going to kind of show it to you. Um, but basically what you'll do is you'll create a signal with two or more phases that represent the doors being closed and the doors being open. And when the signal is red, that means the doors are closed. Uh, so in order to use a signal, you'll have to create a, a pedestrian link, like a cross, similar to a crosswalk, but you'll create it really short so it looks like a door. And then you'll just have a static route that just walks from one end to the other of the network. And then if pedestrians need to pass through this door, they'll kind of walk up and if the signal's red, they'll wait there. If it's green, they'll walk through it. Pretty straightforward. Um, Behaviorally, a good example of this would be something like, you know, Black Friday, you know, if, if like a, a, a store is opening on Black Friday, how everyone kind of crowds near the door. Or at an event where, you know, like a Taylor Swift concert or something like that, where people are like really crowding around the doors. Because the pedestrian behavior in BizWalk around a signal is everyone wants to get as close to that signal as possible. And then when it goes green, they all kind of bum rush through that. Uh, through that signal. Um, the other way we could use do this is with a, uh, do a staging area is with a dwell time. So like we saw before, we'll set up a dwell time distribution. But instead of having a signal that goes green at a particular time, you can set a dwell time distribution and there's a checkbox that says waiting, wait time is relative to the start of the simulation. So what this means is everyone will walk up to the start or, or to the staging area and then at a specific moment in the simulation they will all be released at the same time so again the difference between you know this one and this one is going to be how do they how do they queue up how do they wait for this situation using dwell times is going to be a good example you know the the first one that pops into my mind is if you've ever been to like a trade show or a conference right there's the lobby outside of the lunchroom everyone's standing around talking uh, waiting for for people to open the doors and um, nobody's really kind of waiting at the doors no one's crowding around the doors necessarily they're all kind of like trying to be casual about it but keeping an eye and when the door opens they all kind of they all kind of go at the same time so I have an example file for this um, and it's just more of a demo so I'm not going to set it up from scratch um, but so you can see the differences in behaviors between using a signal trigger and using a dwell time trigger. So when we run the simulation, I have the same number of people being generated on both sides, and then both of them are just being navigated to uh, the destination through a bottleneck of some kind. 
Here though, on the on the top side, I think I need to set this to 100. All right, so on, on the signal side, you see we have the same number of people on both areas. This one, everyone though, on the dwell time side is just kind of spaced out and kind of casually waiting for their timer to, to, to tick down. Whereas over here, everyone's kind of stacked up around the door and they all want to go through that door. And the only thing preventing them that is the door, right? So at 120 seconds into the simulation, so in about 20 seconds, we should see uh, the signal go green. And at the same time, all these people will be released. So here's the 121 second mark. We see this, the door's just gone green. Everyone's crowding through on the signal side. Now, everyone kind of compresses down on this side and walks through. But the difference is just that waiting behavior. Do you want that waiting behavior to be all grouped up around the door, or do you want that waiting behavior to be kind of spaced out or casual, right? And so those are the two kinds of ways that you can kind of set up a staging area um, within, within uh, this walk. Now, in this case, we use the trigger to be a specific type of, uh, of time trigger where there, where it's a preset time. Oh, sorry, what I'll show you is on the area, let me go back to, to VizWalk real quick. On this dwell time area over here, Um, Levi, I we do not hear you anymore. Hello. Yes, you're back. Yes, you're back. Okay, sorry. For some reason, I just have to take it over to phone and back. So um, again, the wait time before start is just relative to the start of the simulation. So the the people that arrive really early and the people that arrive right before the 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 distribution time will um, will all leave at the same time. Um, if you're speaking again, Levi, we still do not hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I don't know what is going on. Um, okay. So, sorry about that. Um, so the recurring time intervals is something like uh, you want to to have people distributing every so many minutes, right? So every two or four minutes or something like that, you're you're sending groups of people through in kind of waves. We also can have a trigger based on vehicle arrivals. So you know a bus or a plane arrives or something like that, and then everybody leaves at the same time to to board that vehicle. And then we also have vehicle dwell times by boarding groups. So you can set up boarding groups so that specific groups of people will leave at specific times. So the first thing we're gonna look at is, or, or sorry, we'll jump into a, a second poll question. Sorry, my audio um, um, kind of got me up, but uh, yeah. So we're gonna look at uh, the second poll question real quick. Are you considering using or implementing uh, VizWalk or Visim in, in crowd management in the near future? Um, so, so we can kind of get an idea of, of, you know, what is what are people planning on doing with 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 Visim? Okay. 
So, um, starting with the recurring time interval releases, what you're going to do is you're going to set up a dwell time distribution that is just really long. And so what this is going to do is this is going to make it so that everyone just kind of hangs out and waits forever uh, on that area until a trigger tells them that they are allowed to leave. Um, and then after we set up that long dwell time, we're going to create that trigger using a, an item in Visa called an attribute modification. This is in your actions menu. And it's kind of like a little mini script, but you don't have to know how to script. Um, it's just all based on the graphic user interface within this. So, um, and the goal here is that we're just going to change their dwell time to zero when certain conditions are met. So within that attribute modification, um, when you create it, there will be this upper section of the attribute modification, and you'll need to specify uh, a time period that you want it to run during. Um, and so our example is going to be, okay, we want to release pedestrians every two minutes, right? Because if we're thinking about something like a theme park ride, right, there might be a roller coaster or, or uh, a theme park vehicle every two minutes or something like that. Um, so you want to have a holding area or a staging area for, for those people. And so they're going to be waiting for two minutes and then they're allowed to go on to, on to the ride. Um, now the object type is going to be the pedestrians in the network and we're going to be updating their dwell time attributes. So they're going to get that dwell time attributes can be set to something like 10,000 seconds. Um, and then upon some sort of trigger, the, in this case, uh, every two minutes, we're going to change their dwell time to zero. But we don't want to do that for all pedestrians in the network because there might be pedestrians doing different activities. So we have this section in the attribute modification called an object filter where we're going to say, okay, we want only the people on area number two to, to release their dwell time. And so in this case, uh, you'll do a construction element number equals two. The reason we call it construction element is because people could also be standing on things like ramps or stairs or elevators or, or something like that. And we only want to release the people on, on a specific construction element. And then in the new attribute section, we're going to be we're going to be recalculating them as their dwell time as zero. So again, every two minutes, they're going to be released out uh, of their of their dwell time. So to see what that looks like in an example file, let me open up my example file real quick. I gotta stop the simulation. Lost you again. Got me back. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, cool. All right. So in the actions menu, um, yeah, I forgot my headset today, so my normal computer microphone is is giving me fits. Um. Okay, so in the actions menu under attribute modifications, we have an attribute modification where we're updating the pedestrians in the network. So here,
Yeah, about five words in before we lost you again. All right, you got me back? Here we go. All right, so, Tess, can you hear me, Sean? You good? Yep, yeah, we're good. Okay, yep, sorry about that. Um, so here we see the period is set to every 1200 seconds, and that's because in our simulation, the simulation runs every 10th of a second. So if you want two minutes, Two minutes is 120 seconds times 10 times steps per second. So that gives us a period of uh, 120. So we can hit play. We can see the pedestrians going at the two minute mark. They'll all just release. And since this is recurring, as the pedestrians build back up, this guy's just hanging out a little bit longer. I don't know why. Um, but as they start to build back up, there'll be more pedestrians that join back in. And then at the at the next two minute mark, they'll they'll be able to leave. Right, and so, and it just kind of keeps doing that over and over again. So if you want to have waves of pedestrians that might join at certain time intervals and then they get sent in with the next wave, you can set up an attribute modification that kind of looks like this. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and that will subsequently release release pedestrians. Now, the next trigger we can do is based on vehicle arrivals. So if we set up uh, the same dwell time distribution, so just like we did before, they'll stand on that area for, for uh, basically an infinite amount of time. Then we'll create an attribute modification. Um, and now here, the period won't be every two minutes. Uh, you can set it up to be every 10, uh, every time step, or I like to make it you know every couple of seconds. If a vehicle is arriving, you know, every 15 minutes, for example, there's no point in having them check for the vehicle every 10th of a second. So it just kind of slows down your simulation. So you might choose to up that period a little bit longer. Um, so here I have it checking every 10 seconds, but even that the vehicles are only arriving every two minutes. So um, 10 sec every, checking every 10 seconds probably isn't too needed, although although you don't want to miss the, the vehicle. So um, again, pedestrians and network, dwell time. The object filter is going to be a little bit different because we're still looking at that construction element. So we, we want to look at that waiting area number. But we want to see if a vehicle is on a parking lot or on, um, on a uh, public transit stop or something like that. And then we have this other uh, object filter in there that says if the dwell time is greater than zero. So we don't want to update pedestrians who have already been updated. Otherwise, vSIM will start throwing some weird errors. So we just throw that in there so that it only affects pedestrians that have already been changed from infinite down to zero dwell time. So by setting this up, um, and then again, we'll set their dwell time to zero. So by setting up this, uh, th this method of release, what we can see is if I come down to the next section, right, we have pedestrians being generated. Oh, didn't mean to open up signal controllers. Uh, we have pedestrians being generated. And then every two minutes, I have a transit vehicle coming through the network. So they're going to wait infinitely until a transit vehicle pulls up, and then they'll board the transit vehicle. Now we do have an automated way of doing this called a waiting area where you can flag a, a, a waiting area and people will wait in that waiting area. So if you're just doing a normal platform or something like that, um, you don't need to do this attribute modification for vehicle arrivals. You can just walk them to that waiting area. The difference with this is that the staging area might be significantly far away or maybe you have several staging areas in a row where you want to like move them from room one to room two and then from room two to the boarding platform. And so you want to like step people into room after room. Um, and so in that case, uh, you, you can't have multiple waiting areas. Otherwise, they'll all just try to run through all the rooms. So in this case, you'll have uh, a staging area and then a waiting area and then the boarding location. 
So we can see that one trigger is based on vehicle arrivals. Okay. And just for uh, a quick break, just because we're we're getting towards the end, I'm going to do the the poll question, uh, a third poll question. So this one is what type of interactive scenario in large scale pedestrian space would you be more interested in simulating? Parks, event entrances, exiting logistics, uh, shuttle transportation to attractions, queuing and other waiting areas, things like that. Okay. All right, thanks for participating. Um, the final one that we're gonna look at, the final releasing trigger that we're gonna look at is by boarding group. So this is gonna be something similar to like airport uh, gates. So we're gonna see uh, that we can create a pedestrian attribute that will notate what uh, boarding group are you a part of, right? So you might create a UDA called boarding group and it might look something like this, right? You have if you think about an airline, right, you have the crew, you have those priority pre-boarding groups, you have the MVPs and all the, you know, gold one and silver one and all that stuff. And then you have general boarding, right? So you need to first indicate which passengers belong to which group. So you'd create a user-defined attribute and then we'd create a distribution to assign pedestrians those different boarding groups. And so your distribution is going to be this little step function here um where you know it might be boarding groups one through four right and so different percentages of people belong to each boarding group then you'll create an object called an attribute decision point where the pedestrians will be assigned a boarding group based on that um based on that distribution so once they have that boarding group, now when they step onto that area, they're still going to get that infinite dwell time like we saw before. And we're going to create an attribute modification that says, okay, we're going to check every so many seconds whether or not the vehicle has arrived, and we're going to update their dwell time. And the, the, the object filter is going to look the same as it did before. So we're looking at the area number, we're looking at whether a vehicle is present, we're looking at people that have already been, whether they've already been updated or not. The difference here is instead of just changing them to zero, we'll put in some sort of function. Now in this function, I've just done a simple one where it's like, all right, what's your boarding group number? And we're going to multiply that by 15 seconds. So that means boarding group one goes immediately, Boarding group two goes 15 seconds later. Boarding group three goes 15 seconds after that. And boarding group four goes 15 seconds after that. Um, now, I just did that for demonstration purposes, so it goes nice and quick. But on an airline, right, it might be, you know, multiplied by two to five minutes, right? You could also set up, instead of just a simple uh, multiplication here, you can set up an if function. So you can say, if you're in boarding group one, your dwell time is zero. If you're in boarding group two, your dwell time is two minutes. If you're in boarding group three, then your dwell time is seven minutes, you know, and so on and so forth. So you can create a, a more complex scenario if you wanted to. And the effect of that is essentially going to be, if we move down one, right, we're gonna see pedestrians arriving in this area. And I have a pedestrian attribute decision that is updating a boarding group attribute by a boarding group uh, distribution. So as they arrive in the network, they are being assigned various boarding groups. So if I turn on my label, right, the purple is the crew, green is the elite, yellow is the MVP, and then, um, you know, general boarding, right? So we've all been at an airline before where it's like there's seven different tiers of elite status, right, before you can actually board. Um, and then every two minutes, uh, we have our, our vehicle arriving. So we should see a vehicle arriving here pretty quickly. Uh, here we go. So here comes our, our, our vehicle. Now, instead of everybody, like over here, everybody just rushing all at once, here we have it going based on boarding group. So the purple get to go first, and then 15 seconds later, the greens get to go, 
and then 15 seconds later the the yellow ones get to go and then 15 seconds later our our red ones get to go so you can see that we're boarding by 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 groups so again three ways to trigger that is uh you can just have a recurring trigger you can have a vehicle based trigger where everyone goes all at once or you can have it based on boarding group and so now now we have those triggers kind of outlined we can now move on to our to you know our big finale which is how do we set up a theme park ride and instead of having a bunch of slides that um um kind of display that i'm just going to jump right into the model And in our model, what we'll see is we'll see a series of informal cues and formal cues. So here we have a theme park ride that I just kind of randomly set up. It's nothing, it's probably the most boring theme park ride in the world that you've ever seen. But what we have is we have people walking into the ride area and then you're going through kind of that, that S queue area. Now, the way that we've set up this initial queue space is instead of having this be like a formalized queuing area, we have it be an informal queue. So here on this first blue pad, we have an infinite dwell time with a trigger. And that trigger is just checking to see if there are 40 people in the next room. If there are less than 40 people in the next room, so there might be you know, some sort of employee or something like that, monitoring how many people are walking into this first staging area and if more than 40 people walk into this room then they'll start holding people up at this initial queue then as they walk into this first staging area they step onto this pad and there might be some sort of description of the ride some sort of of um you know social engineering where it's like you're still in a queue but people are are you're you're kind of distracting people with some flashing lights or something like that so again, on this first staging area, we have another infinite queue, right? So they're just standing there and we have another trigger that just says every two minutes, we're gonna release these pedestrians on this, on this staging area. So what we should see is every two minutes, these pedestrians just get to go on to the next, the next room. So here in about 20 simulation seconds, we should see that happen. So now they all, at the same time should get to go on to the next room. So here they, they step into the next room and then we do the same thing in staging area two. There might be some sort of, you know, video, some sort of, you know, storytelling going on or something like that. But they're, we're really just kind of spacing out the pedestrians for later on down the ride. So there's not like a massive queue right before, right before the lock, right, right. So here we have staging area two, we just have the same thing going on, just another every two minutes, um, pedestrians are allowed to Levi, you went out again. Okay, you got me back? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Finally, we have another informal queue where they're kind of funneled into this last section and then we have just like we saw at the very beginning a uh, a formal queue that says join only if there's less than four people at each line so now people go join and they're kind of waiting for the roller coaster or whatever it is to come up and we have four people waiting at each spot now the trick here is with this final queue i have a waiting area with a time distribution that's infinite and my trigger is if on this roller coaster section, the roller coaster can only hold in my model can only hold 32 people. So what I have is you can continue on to the next stage if there are less than 32 people ahead of you. And if there's no roller coaster joined up. So there might be some sort of crew member or something there that says, wait, until the roller coaster leaves so that way these people can board the roller coaster and even though there's less than 32 people on this staging area 
somebody or something like a gate or or a person is holding them back and saying wait um because otherwise these people will try to run on and join the the roller coaster and then once the roller coaster leaves now the conditions are met where there's no roller coaster at the stop and there's less than 32 people so now this dwell time gets changed to zero and then they can proceed on to their waiting areas where we have these pads here are checked as queues. They have a time distribution of infinite proportions again. And then it's just, again, just like we saw before, a vehicle release where they're waiting for a vehicle to be in front of them. So they'll join the queue, they'll count up to four people in each line, and then once four people in each line join, the rest get held back and they wait for their next roller coaster to join. So now if I just run it a little bit, we can see them join, right? So this is just a, a fun example that shows the different types of queuing that you might have. Now, if I were to suddenly ramp up the volumes, uh, we would start to see this space get filled, just like we do over here. See how they're, they're not in a single file line. They're just kind of filling the, the queuing space, right? So if I were to ramp up the volume or increase the throughput of these staging areas, um, we would have some informal queuing where, where we're just kind of corralled groups of people. They're not necessarily in single file lines, right? So um, it's kind of more of like a glorified hallway, right? So this kind of leads us to uh, our final poll question. So we'll launch one more poll question and then we'll do a Q&A. And then if you've answered the poll question, please jump into the chat um, and, and start throwing in questions if you haven't already done so. Um, and then we'll do a, a Q&A afterwards. Okay. So for the last, you know, five minutes or so, if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, Sean, did we get any questions during the... Uh, during the the Q and A or during the, the presentation? Yeah, uh, we did get some two questions which I answered, but maybe you could expand on them. Two questions are basically the same regarding importing elevation data, um, any file types, how to um, represent the basically the Z coordinate as far as um, analyzing different pedestrian methods. I had mentioned that. As far as roadway, there's the grade feature, which is not automatically imported, and pedestrian behavior for ramps is, but maybe you know something else um, to connect point A and point B. Yeah, so in um, in uh, VISM, under the imports, we do have CAD imports and BIM imports and shapefile imports. So what you'd want to do is start by creating different levels with different preset Z coordinates. So if you have different like floor plans, like maybe you have a um, like a a transit center or something like that, where there's like the the subway platform level, there's another subway platform level, then there's a street level, and then maybe an upper level, right? So you create those macro levels initially, and then you can import the floor plans onto those relative levels, and then build stairs or elevators, or escalators between them. Um, and then uh, those would be represented both in 2D and in 3D. So here I have it all on a 2D plane, um, but these areas, you know, they'll they'll get a level assigned to them, but you can also in the display section assign a Z offset. So even within that level, you can have subtle differences in heights. So maybe your broad levels are are, you know, 20 foot differences between the between your different floors or something like that but then within a floor you have like a slight ramp going down or a slight ramp going up um, and this could be good to represent because you might have different mobility concerns 
uh, where, you know, there might be a staircase and a ramp. And so some people might need to take a staircase and some people might take the ramp or maybe you have an escalator and an elevator, right? And so some people might need to take the, or prefer to take the elevator uh, over the escalators, right? And so you can control those, those movements using Z elevations. From the link side of it, the links have their intermediate points. So if we open up the link list um, here and then go to points 3D, they have X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, the X, Y coordinates though are just Cartesian. Um, so if you want to get those into from like GIS or something, you kind of have to go a roundabout way. You can like import them through uh, Vizoom. Vizoom will import your GIS coordinates and then you can uh, bring in those Z coordinates from there. I think Vizoom 2024 also has some elevation data in its in its uh, model. So if you're trying to import GIS, it might bring in 3D as well. I need to check on that. But in VSUM, there's not a good way to import links um, from like GIS data. So you have to kind of run it through Vizoom first. Uh, but with the VizWalk, on the, on the pedestrian area side, you can do all that with floor plans and shape files. Yeah, I should mention that um, we've been working on automated import with the BIM, i.e. the system itself tries to define what a level, what a ramp, what an elevator is based on the information it's receiving. Let's get a few more in while we got yeah. the chance. Um, can a pedestrian signal be controlled by a formula? Or I'm guessing UDA, formula uh there's a lot of formulas in this one yeah so yeah, one so of the one. attribute modifications that you can do is towards uh, a signal group so you don't want to necessarily edit the signal controllers or the signal heads but the signal group you can change the signal state so if you want to change the signal state based on certain conditions right you would just create an attribute modification you'd have a check-in period so how frequently do you want this to update if you want it to be like every second you type in a 10 and then you could adjust that signal state so you'd still have to create like a dummy signal that has at least one signal group so that you can update that signal group but then you could have say okay if a vehicle is not present signal state red right if a vehicle is pre present signal state green or you know every two minutes you know, swap the signal states or something like that, right? So you'd still have to go in and create a signal controller that has just at least, you know, it could be an RVC, it could be a fixed time, it could be whatever controller you want it to be, but it has to have at least one signal group. And then in the attribute modifications, you can, again, find the signal groups option and then update the signal state of that, of that signal group based on whatever conditions you want it to be. So, you know, if it's based on number of pedestrians, right, or, or you know, more vehicular exercise would be you'd have a taxi stand and then you'd have an offsite queue or an offset queue somewhere, you know, a few hundred meters upstream where you're holding back uh, the other taxis so that you're not overflowing the taxi stand. And then if the number of taxis drops at the, at the curbside drops below a certain number, change the signal state to green or something like that, right? Um, so you could always do something like that as well. Um, let's do one more real quick. Um, mm -hmm. is, there, is there a way to incorporating spacing between people in a queue to reflect social distancing? I know that's a behavior question. Yeah, so we do have uh, in the in the walking behaviors, we have um, uh, the the social behaviors, the asocial, isotropic and mean these control the the spacing between people uh but you can also go into the network settings um and we do have social distancing where is it pedestrian behavior so you could put in um various uh radius for computation of pedestrians personal area so by default it's two meters right for social distancing but you can always increase or decrease this value um and this would help determine okay if people are um within that social distance then you can come back into your walking behaviors and and um 
it would basically flag pedestrians whether they're within other people's personal bubbles and then you can increase or decrease the the walking behaviors to reflect that so like for example on my informal queuing areas i updated the walking behaviors so that there'd be less noise so they're not like jittery they're kind of standing around so there's zero noise and i increased the um the spacing between people so they kind of don't cluster so closely right so in the queues um they kind of spread out a little bit um in these informal queuing areas so they're not like just pushing up against each other because there's no reason to push right so um you can change these values to to um, make them a little less dense um, and a little less noisy. Um, any other, yeah. Tiffany, I don't know um, if we need to log off now or if whether you want to keep answering questions. Yeah. Yes, I think All now you. will be a good time. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, again, uh, we have more webinars starting up in 2024 and we have our VSIM introduction training next week if you wanna sign up for that. Um, otherwise, thanks for, thanks for listening. Yes, thank you for attending our session for today. As a reminder, we will provide a recording and a follow-up email. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us to our personal emails, rmarketing.us at ptvgroup.com and have a great holiday.